and took drastic measures. Over the course of the next year, he laid off close to 12,000 workers and shuttered more than 600 stores in the U.S. alone. What was the mood like inside Starbucks at that point? Horrible. People were outside crying, hugging each other. It went from being wildly successful and growing so fast to suddenly having layoffs. I just believed in my heart and soul that, that once we began to do the right things, our customers would come back. Schultz focused on the front lines. He retrained thousands of baristas and brought on Arthur Rubenfeld, a trained architect with an have. eye for detail. The barista should never turn their backs on the customer. And that is why in all Starbucks stores, the espresso machines always are on the front counter. It's a very different experience than if she was making coffee with her back to you. When you walk in the doors here, the barista is the first thing you see. That's yes. not by accident. A lot of conversations were held about placement of this bar. And we decided to put what we call the theater towards the window line. We talk about it as, as theater, sure. as the experience. It's just a coffee place. People are you just know, coming in to get their coffee and go. To us, it's much, much more than that. Rubenfeld claims these subtle touches create the feel of an authentic coffee house and enhance the Starbucks experience, a word they apply to almost every aspect of their business. We also understand what we call environmental psychology. You feel less alone when you're sitting at a round table, but when the table has square edges, it's a more formal feeling. And while the company has refined its operations, it's been challenged by both McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts, which have increased their coffee quality, choices, and sales. Starbucks' real growth is overseas, in some places known more for tea than coffee. We have 800 stores in Greater China, 400 in the mainland. And it's going extraordinarily well because we have changed the coffee pattern for Chinese people. The last few years of upheaval and rethinking seem to be working. In 2010, Starbucks pulled in almost a billion dollars in profits, a record. We are now at the cusp, the precipice, of doing something that no one believed we could do. The company recently celebrated its 40th anniversary and changed its logo. Howard Schultz says he's here to stay, and this time taking nothing for granted. We have less than 10% share of the overall coffee market in North America, as big as, as people think we are. There's a big prize out there for Starbucks, and believe me when I tell you, the best is yet to come. Up next, a valuable commodity. The method to the madness of coffee prices. It's very emotional. Every tip you see that moves on there, somebody's winning, somebody's losing. We dive into the pit when the coffee addiction returns. For many of the world's 1.6 billion coffee drinkers, the price of their morning cup is set here in Lower Manhattan. At the Intercontinental Exchange. Coffee trader Eric Rodiger is at the center of it all. It's no accident that this is set up like a ring. Correct. This is like gladiator. Only the strong survive. Absolutely. You have to have skin like a rhino, three feet thick. Rodiger and 60 other traders bid to buy and sell coffee to set its future market price. Any interest in this bad boy? Your customers could be anybody from who? It could be anybody from overseas, Nestle, Starbucks, to the local Joe Schmo out in Iowa or somebody who wants to trade. Coffee futures. So you're trading for the big guys, big guys, the Deutsche guys. Bank, Goldman Sachs, you name it. Coffee is one of the most actively traded commodities in the world. On the day we were there, in April 2011, prices were near a 34-year high, and a single lot, 37,500 pounds of beans, sold for $100,000 
about 284 a pound. And that's it. Why does the price keep going up? Speculation. Like crude oil. Look at crude oil. The way that it is. It's rallying, rallying, rallying. Why? I don't know why. There's more oil around here than, uh, you know what I mean? You're saying it's not a supply and demand issue. There's plenty of coffee in the world. Speculators may be driving up coffee prices, but the industry is also at the mercy of Mother Nature. Bad weather, plant disease, even pests can ruin a harvest and limit supply. You think the average coffee drinker knows that? Not at all. Doesn't even have a clue. They just go in there and say, I got my half cap, double two cap. And they pay their four dollars and fifty cents and walk away. While coffee beans may not pay attention to prices, coffee farmers do. Back in Peru, growing coffee is Guzman Pulica's sole source of income. So this trip to the local co-op for his annual harvest is an important one. The co-op inspects his beans for defects, excessive moisture and stones. And from there, prices are set. It's a good coffee. It's clean. When we smell it, it smells clean. For each 120-pound bag of green coffee sold for export, Guzman is paid $232. This year's harvest, a good one, went entirely to Seattle coffee buyer Phil Beatty, who paid Guzman $6,500, almost twice what he would have gotten just a year ago. The key ingredients of a successful relationship coffee model are all, are all here. <laughs> and now, Phil Beatty needs to get his beans back to the States long and costly process. The beans he paid $2.70 a pound for in Peru cost him $3.83 after shipment to the U.S. After those beans are roasted and packaged, the cost goes to almost $7 a pound. Add in marketing and distribution cost, he's up to $10.50. And finally, after accounting for overhead and profit, the retail price of Phil Beatty's high quality coffee beans comes to $14.70 a pound. Coffee farmers only see a fraction of that, which is where Paul Rice comes in. The fair trade guarantees that farmers get more money for their hard work. As president and CEO of Fair Trade USA, Rice tries to help farmers get their fair share. They're selling to middlemen who basically roll up in a truck and say, okay, today's price is X, take it or leave it. And so that's precisely the problem that fair trade is trying to help farmers overcome. Do you know right now that coffee prices are so high? See, I can We are selling it very cheaply. We know that. The people who are making the money are the people who buy it from us and resell it. By eliminating the middlemen, fair trade ensures the growers themselves are paid a fair minimum price by American coffee wholesalers when prices are down and on the flip side, giving them the right to renegotiate when coffee prices are high. The money that goes back to farmers through fair trade is precisely what allows those farmers to reinvest in quality. It's such an accomplishment that these people can get this coffee from so far away out in the mountains all the way down to this mill where it was processed and now I just can't wait to get it into the roaster and, and taste it with my customers. CNBC. We marked those Arabica beans just before they were shipped to the U.S. Two months and 4,000 miles later, we were there with Phil Beatty in Sumner, Washington, when our precious cargo arrived. La Familia de Guzman. Yeah, and that's the stuff. Beatty roasted the beans at 425 degrees for 14 minutes, and then came the moment of truth. Cheers. Cheers. That moment when you get that flashback to being on the farm, seeing Guzman, following the mules down the muddy trail, it all comes back and it just makes that cup so enjoyable. That's great. It was a long way to go for a cup of coffee and a window into what it takes to get a pound of Guzman Julica's finest to the store shelf where it sells for $14 and 70 cents. I'll never think about coffee the same again.
The coffee business is a crowded, competitive field, hard to break into, and even harder to break out. Coming up, how one man found his calling and made a fortune. Most people have a cup of coffee, they don't think anything of it. You had a cup of coffee and it almost changed your life. That cup of coffee did change my life. The Mean Green Money Machine, next. One of the greatest success stories of the $30 billion American coffee industry can be found here in the Green Mountains of Vermont. <laughs> People appreciate a good product. <laughs> it begins with a free-spirited entrepreneur who took a breakthrough idea all the way to the top. What do you make of the success of your company? you believe it? Oh, I, I believe it. <laughs> Why not? Robert Stiller is the founder and chairman of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, a company that now supplies the lion's share of single-serve coffee. Eighty percent market share. I don't know too many businesses that can say that. It's a great product. <laughs> Thirty years ago, any kind of market share was a distant dream when Stiller was a wealthy ski bum. It started with a cup of coffee after a day on the slopes. I used to come up to Sugarbush and ski, and there was a shop that opened that was roasting fresh quality coffees from around the world, and it was so much better than any coffee that I had ever experienced. Most people have a cup of coffee, they don't think anything of it. You had a cup of coffee, and it almost changed your life. Certainly, that cup of coffee did change my life. We bought the company and started opening up some retail shops. Green Mountain has brought Stiller a fortune, but it's not the first time he's hit it big by catering to our vices. He was already a millionaire, living the high life in the high altitudes of Vermont, after selling a company he'd made a bundle off of, Easy Wider Rolling Paper. Where did the idea for Easy Wider come from? A friend of mine noticed that everybody would put two pieces of paper together, they would glue them together and was like, why doesn't somebody just make a paper that's wider? You must be a cult hero well, some among people. marijuana <laughs> smokers. Stiller may have hit it big with potheads, but the specialty coffee market proved a tougher one to crack. People were still in the habit of buying their coffee in a can from the supermarket. Well, let's say it started a lot slower than I thought it would. Is it true that you lent the company a million dollars? Oh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then some? And then some, yeah. Green Mountain eventually made its way into gas stations, convenience stores, and hotels. And then came a move that would change the company forever. In 2006, Stiller struck liquid gold when he bought Keurig Incorporated. But this is nice. You're constantly getting a freshly brewed cup of coffee. In a single stroke, Green Mountain became the biggest player in single-serve coffee. Um, using the K-Cup technology. This is the machine that is changing the way consumers prepare and enjoy coffee. All because of that? All because of that system. <laughs> that sounds like a sales it. pitch. It is a sales pitch, but you try it. Larry Blanford is Green Mountain's most enthusiastic salesman and its CEO. Under his leadership, putting the K-Cups, as they're known, and the brewing system under one roof, has proven to be a game changer. We borrowed on the Gillette razor, razor blade approach because we do have a very unique situation here where uh, under one corporate umbrella we do have both the appliance technology and the beverage technology. So the business model is built on selling the machines for nearly at cost. And making the money on, on the portion packs, right. How much do you make off one of these cups? We don't provide that detail. <laughs> but um, certainly, whatever the profit is, when you multiply it by the hundreds of millions and billions, those pennies add up. And they do. Analysts expect Green Mountain to sell nearly 7 billion K cups in 2012 at about 65 cents a pod. Sales of 336 million in 2007 when you took over. Sales last year, almost one and a half billion dollars. Been heading for more this year. And we've just added on this whole section that you're looking at. But there's also trouble brewing. In September 2010, shareholders questioned how those profits were being counted. Today, Green Mountain is facing multiple lawsuits, and the SEC is looking into its accounting practices. A lot of ups and downs clearly for the coffee maker Green Mountain over the last few months. Are you concerned at all about the SEC 
inquiry or the lawsuits that are pending against the company? I don't think I can comment on that. The lawsuits are alleging securities fraud. That's heady stuff. It's very heady stuff, but you cannot comment on it. It's against the law. Stiller's silence and the ongoing inquiry don't seem to be affecting the company's growth or scaring off the big guns. Yeah, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, one of the big movers today, hitting fresh highs and reports the K-Cup makers in partnership talks with Starbucks. Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, and others are clamoring to get their coffee into those K-Cups. I think we enter into this deal with great respect with regard to Green Mountain. I have French vanilla. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. For now, Green Mountain is the dominant player in the single-serve game. But by 2013, two of their patents will expire leaving the field open for others. They're important patents, but more importantly, if we deliver great products, with or without patents, we're going to be in good shape. Hey, Bob. Hey, Larry. How are you doing? At 68, Robert Stiller hasn't lost his entrepreneurial spirit and sees even more room for growth as he transforms his once tiny coffee company into a diversified beverage company as Green Mountain fills those pods with iced tea, hot cider, and cocoa. You feel like you're on top of the mountain? Yeah, Vermont is, uh, you know, it's a wonderful place. The business is on top of the mountain. And so is the coffee industry. Several centuries after the coffee bean first created a buzz, and four decades after a place called Starbucks first opened its doors, the humble cup of joe is as hot as ever, helping to get more than a billion people through the day, every day. Double shirt, Americano, please one gulp at a time. I'm Scott Wapner. Thanks for watching.